Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am Christine Dixon of The Ordinary Sacred, and I'm very excited to start a new video series that I'm calling Come to the Library. And I kind of imagine you all coming in, sitting on the floor, crisscross applesauce, or maybe just making yourself comfortable in a chair with a blanket and a drink and coming to listen to me, the librarian, uh, read some of my favorite passages from internal family systems books. So my many of you know that my special interest, aka obsession, is internal family systems. And I have read 30 plus books on IFS. And if there's a new one that comes out, you can you better believe I'm going to read it. Um, and so this is really my way of sharing those highlights with you, either so that you don't have to read the book or so that you're inspired to read the book. And I'm actually going to kind of start backwards. I'm going to start with the book that I'm currently reading because I'm loving it. Highly recommend it. And it is Internal Family Systems Therapy for Shame and Guilt by Martha Sweezy. And Martha is an excellent communicator, in my opinion. She co-wrote what's considered the textbook of IFS, Internal Family Systems Therapy, second edition, with Dick Schwartz, the founder of IFS. And this is her new book on shame and guilt. And it's just excellent. She explains the difference between shame and guilt. She talks about the shame cycle. I'm going to do it uh, the next video about that because it's brilliant, the six acts of the shame cycle. But for today, I'm going to start with a passage that I just loved. Whenever a book is so rich and full, usually I need to marinate in it. I'll, and I read this passage and I just marinated in it for days and processed it and basked in it. And so I wanted to share it with you. It is on page 23 and it's all about change in therapy. So this will be helpful if you are a therapist, a coach, a practitioner, and also if you're someone who goes to therapy or gets coaching or counseling. And the title is, What's Change Got to Do with Therapy? Which makes me think, what's change got to do, got to do with it? Um, and so I'm just going to read it to you. Make yourself comfortable. So Martha says, Clients tend to start therapy either seeking change or dreading it and refusing to change. Manager parts are the ones who seek change. They want to change the essence of the exile and the behavior of firefighter parts. They work hard and they're tired. Firefighters, on the other hand, focus more narrowly on changing the arousal state of the autonomic nervous system whenever threatening beliefs like I'm worthless, I'm unlovable from exiles evoke strong feelings. They work hard too, although they rarely admit to being tired. If clients come to therapy with any intent, it's usually the managerial intent to change. Their manager team tells them to become a better person, be braver, be stronger, be more lovable, get control of that uncontrolled disinhibition. These parts expect the therapist to rally to the cause and lead them to success. If we focus on change in therapy, we reinforce their belief that self-reinvention can solve the problem of having been shamed, which it cannot. When we call therapy work, though I admit it can be hard to avoid the word, we inadvertently reinforce the managerial belief that working harder will change that shameful exile into someone lovable. Because managerial efforts to change the exile are, from my perspective, at the heart of the problem, I don't want managers focusing on work or change in therapy. So I interrupt work monologues that are characterized by the word do. What should I do? I have to do something. I tried to do this or I tried to do that. 
to suggest that something different and better will happen if they stop working. In fact, they could stop right now and do nothing for just a few moments to see how it feels. I may joke about child labor laws, and I may say in all seriousness that I don't plan to work. Hard work will not help parts feel legitimate and lovable, and none of them needs to change who they are. That said, my challenge to the ethos of earned love is certain to lack credibility at first. I know the client's capital S self can sanction a part's existence. I know that the self can annul harsh judgments. I know that their exiles could see shamefulness as inaccurate information from a disturbed source and they could let it go. This is the hope of the therapist that they hold the confidence. I know that the whole internal system would be relieved if this were to happen. And I know that all parts need to be in relationship with the client's capital S self. Protectors don't have to do anything about this beyond being willing to stop doing whatever they do. When they stop doing and stand by, the self shows up, which drains their drive to keep doing. But if this is to happen, they need direct experience with the self. So we may need to start with little experiments. This is something I say all the time. Before protectors will allow bigger ones, small experiments. But in any case, change happens when protectors stop working on change. Isn't that ironic? Paradoxical. When exiles unburden, protectors volunteer to open the sluice gates and life flows and the normal state of things reasserts itself. And the normal state of things is change. I just thought that was so brilliant. It puts the whole process of therapy and really of all of our, you know, parts that are focused on self-improvement, self-help, um, into perspective, that they are these managerial parts that have beautiful intentions that are trying to change the very essence and nature of our exiles, because those parts of us have been shamed somehow. Uh, and so they're trying to suppress exile those parts so that our whole can be considered lovable. If we learn that being sensitive or being overweight or being uh, unintelligent, not being able to do math or art or whatever is going to elicit shame in our environment. We develop these critics. Oh, let's shame that. Let's push it. Let's push it down. Push those qualities down so that we can be acceptable, right? And that's really the, the mission of these managerial parts is let's push down parts that are unacceptable so that we can be better and we can be lovable. The problem with protectors, though, is that they they can't achieve what they really want to achieve, and they don't understand that the only way to that end goal is the connection, actually, between the self and the parts, because the self knows that every part of us is already acceptable, that it already has innate worth, that our sensitivity has worth. Our bodies have worth, um, our capacities, our levels of intelligence, wherever they are, they're all okay. They're all worthy. And when those parts can bask in the, the natural unconditional love and worthiness that self can give them, then they're no longer vulnerable to the outside shaming or the inside shaming and those managerial parts that are trying to cause change or the firefighter parts that are trying to numb us and help us escape in different ways from the, the nervous system dysregulation that comes from the pain of shame, they can rest. And so it's really this cycle of being the hope merchant, right? Of letting these parts know what if 
you could try even just for 10 seconds, 30 seconds to relax and not have to do anything. Just let the client's self emerge to be in relationship with these parts that you so tirelessly protect. What if you could see what happens then? Right. And then once they gain evidence that that is by far the most direct and effective and compassionate healing model, healing uh, experience that the inner system has, then they begin much more being much more willing to relax and not do. And it's ironic or paradoxical, like Martha says, because that change ends up happening very naturally. Uh there's no efforting, there's no striving, there's no working for it. And last thing I'll say about this is just that, you know, something I noticed when I was an educational therapist that I've talked about, and it was just, again, kind of being like Dick Schwartz was with his clients, observing and being open to what's working, what's not working. And what I found worked with my clients uh, with ADHD and other um, uh, learning differences was to just observe themselves without judgment. And what I was really encouraging, I realize now, was this self-energy, was to just say, ah, let me just observe the behavior of these parts without efforting to fix it, to do something about it, to shame it. And I and they can notice those parts too, right? In my Tuesday groups, this is kind of the first thing we always do is what I call a noticing practice. And to me, this is the heart of internal family systems is let me just notice the parts that want to fix, want to get to the roots, want to effort. Those are all parts as well. And we can back up and appreciate and notice them too. But the self energy knows that just in the loving, non-judgmental gaze of the self, that natural change and improvement will happen. So what I had noticed, I was going to say as an educational therapist, was that if I could just encourage my clients to notice after the fact, uh, usually it was something that was shamed in the culture, right? Like they couldn't pay attention or they were too hyper or, you know, too uh, distracted, whatever it was. And I'd say, let's just notice the behavior without any punishment without any judgment without any shame whatsoever like oh I just noticed that I didn't catch anything that was said (laughs) you know the teacher said there huh that's interesting I notice it and what I found was that as they were able to notice without shame or judgment their natural ability to notice would progress to after the fact to during the fact they would be listening to something and they go, Oh, I notice my mind wandering, or I notice my body, you know, twitching and getting hyper or, ha, that's so interesting. And then gradually that awareness without trying to make it do this at all, it would just naturally move to before the fact they'd start seeing clearly the patterns. Oh, when the teacher starts talking about numbers that my body and mind respond like this when this person starts talking or when uh, in this environment or when this comes into play they started noticing the patterns and the specifics and I found that with this non-judgmental gaze of their behavior that it would just begin to naturally change now by change I don't necessarily mean that it It was exactly what the teachers and the parents wanted. It might be that that student realized, I hate that. I don't enjoy it. Uh, I don't have the capacity for it. And that's okay. I'm not going to spend all my energy on that. I'm going to do the bare minimum. And I'm going to put my energy on the things that give me life, that I love, that I'm proficient in. And that was the choice they could make because they saw that. Or maybe they realized, wow, these certain people have my body has a problem with these certain people or with these certain rules or in this kind of environment what can I do to advocate for for myself and the change just came very naturally without striving so 
I loved this passage. Uh, tell me what you think about it in the comments. I would love to hear.